Good morning. It's so good to see all of you here today. Those of you in person and those joining us online, welcome to First Baptist Richardson. This is a great day. We recognize our graduating seniors and we say we love you and are so grateful for you and looking forward to what God's going to do for you in the near and far future. Let's stand up and let's give God our best praise.
Whether you're a graduating senior or you're somewhere else along your journey, know that Jesus says he is with you. He's with us through the power of his Holy Spirit. And that is something to celebrate and to trust in his promises. Let's thank him for that right now. Jesus, thank you for the promises that you will never leave us, that you will never turn your backs on us. Even when we turn our backs on you, you've promised to pursue us. Lord, may we do the same to pursue loving you, serving you, to grow in you. Lord, may that be our prayer. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Congratulations to our graduates, and probably, maybe even more appropriately, congratulations to the parents. Uh, yes, <laughs> they made it. They made it, and now the real fun begins. Uh, as um, you only thought you've been spending a lot of money on them, and now it really, it really happens. Um, I had a graduate this year as well. Celeste, my youngest child, graduated from UT San Antonio, 
as kind of an ironic joke played on her Aggie daddy. She graduated from UT. But um, it's, it's great to see you here. It really is. We're going to be preaching from, the, uh, I'm, I'm going to be preaching from Romans. We're going to be studying. This is part of our well readings uh, this, this last week, Romans chapter 1. If you're not involved in the well, I encourage you to do that. You can get a copy of the well journal at the welcome desk and, and join us as we're going through the New Testament together this year as a church. And uh, we're in Romans chapter 1, and I'm going to be talking to you about Romans chapter 1 today. And, and uh, what I have to say, I think what God has, has for us this morning is for everyone, but I'm going to be addressing it very specifically to our graduating students this year. This year. Um, and as I was reading through that and the Apostle Paul writing in that first chapter, the word that kind of, the phrase that came to me was the idea of, I can't wait. It's something that Paul is saying in this letter from the very beginning is that he's saying, I can't wait. I can't wait to see you. He's writing to Christians living in Rome. He's saying, I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to be with you. I can't wait to spend time with you. Uh, and as I, as I thought about that, I thought about you. And, and my feelings also are, are similar in that I can't wait to see what God is going to do in you, with you, and through you. You are so very special. Very special. And God is going to do amazing things through you. You're just starting this journey that God has for you. And I can't wait to see what God is going to do with you, in you, and through you. And, and so we're going to read in just a little, well, in a little bit from Romans chapter 1, verses 8 to 17. And there's a lot happening in these 10 verses. Uh, the Apostle Paul is actually living in Macedonia in a place called Corinth, a city. And he is, he is writing the letter from there. And he has these plans. He's about to embark on this journey just like you are. And he's not sure what the journey is, but he has his plans. And his plan is actually to, to go to Jerusalem to take this love offering that he's been collecting from the churches in that area. He's been collecting a love offering for the Christians in Jerusalem because there's been this great famine in that area and they're suffering. And so he's collected a, an offering, a money, love offering for them. And his plan is to take it to Jerusalem. He's going to spend a few weeks in Jerusalem. These are his plans. And, and deliver the offering and spend some time with the Christians there. And then he wants to go on to Rome, to Italy, because who doesn't want to go to Italy, right? And so he wants, his plan is then to go to Italy, to Rome, where there's a church there. And, uh, and he wants to spend maybe a couple months with them. And he's hoping that they will help him fund a missionary trip to Spain. He ultimately wants to go to Spain. If you think about where Spain is, if you remember geography, and it's been a while for you, but geography where Spain is right on the coast, right of the, the western coast of, the, of, the, of Europe, uh, and it is like the Atlantic Ocean is right there. That's as far as you could go, basically, right, in that day and time. Uh, many people in that day and time believe you go any further and you, like, drop off right at the edge. It's like, that's as far as you go. Jesus has said, go to the uttermost parts of the earth. And Paul wants to go to Spain, which for him was the uttermost parts of the earth. Those are his, his plans. And so before he leaves on that journey, he writes a letter to the Christians living in Rome saying, I can't wait to get to Rome to see you, to spend time with you. Uh, and, and I just, I can't wait. Um, and we have a copy of that letter, the letter that Paul actually wrote. We have a copy of it. And it's the letter in the New Testament we call uh, the letter of Romans. And I want to read there, starting with the first chapter, beginning with verse 8. This is what Paul writes. He says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. Paul is saying, we've already heard about you Christians living in Rome. Your, your, your reputation is, is all over the Mediterranean world. He says, and I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. He's saying, I can't wait to come see you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you but have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you just as if I, ha I have had among other Gentiles. He's saying, I can't wait. I've been trying to get to see you and now I'm going to get to do it. I am obligated, he says, both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. 
For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, the righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. So I grew up in the church, like many of you, from the time I was a baby, um, and I grew up in the Baptist church, and um, my parents had become Baptist. Most of the family was either Catholic. We had our Catholic side of the family, and we had our Pentecostal side of the family, right? So when we needed to take communion, we would go to the, to the uh, Catholic side, and we wanted to, somebody to pray for us. We went to the Pentecostal side because they know how to pray, <laughs> and they know how to pray. But my parents became Baptist, so I was brought up in the Baptist church. And so being brought up in the Baptist church, I did all the things that you do, right? When you're brought up in the Baptist church. I was in RAs, that was Royal Ambassadors, that was like the Baptist Boy Scouts. So I was, I was in that, and I sang in the choir, right? And I was in the youth group, and at one point I was the president of the youth group. We had this thing called, I know, it's weird, we had a president. So I was the head of the, basically, youth council. I did all those things. And we were in church all the time. Some people say, like, I was in church every time the door was open. My parents had a key to the door. We were the ones who opened the door, right? And so I was in church all the time. Never missed a Sunday all the way through, through high school. And then I went to A&M. Ooh. Okay, thank you. I was waiting for that. <laughs> then I went to A&M, and something changed about that. Like, almost immediately, something changed. It's not that I stopped believing in God or that I rejected Jesus or that I rejected the church. I didn't, I didn't do any of those things. It's not that I was angry at the church. I had a great experience in church. It's not that I was, like, down on faith or anything, but something definitively changed. It's like this thing that was always, like, in the front seat of the car with me, this thing that was always there because, I guess, my parents made sure it was there, this thing that was such a huge, I mean, humongous part of my life church and faith and God, this thing that was big in my life and was there all the time, week in and week out, suddenly I noticed that it actually got put into the trunk of my car, kind of out of sight, out of mind. It's not that it was gone or that I rejected it. It just wasn't really in the front seat anymore. And I'm not even sure when it happened or how it happened. When I first went to A&M, I, started, I was in church every Sunday and then every other Sunday, and then once a month, and then, you know, how that goes. And somehow, that faith that had become such a big part of my life was just uh, a small part of a life where I was experiencing so many other great things. I want to tell you that story about my life because that, as it turns out, is a very, very dangerous thing for that to happen where your faith, the thing that you've invested in, the, the values that you've been taught, they go from the front seat of the car with you all the time into the trunk of the car that you only open up every once in a while. The Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the Christians living in Rome. He knows some of them. He doesn't know all of them. But he gives them this advice, and I just want to give this to you, like this a few things I want you to keep in mind as you embark on this journey now and as things are going to begin to change for you. They just are. They always do. And that's not a bad thing that they change. But I, there's a couple of things I want you to think about and keep in mind. The Apostle Paul gives them to us in the part I just read. See, in this, in this letter, he's going to tell them all about the gospel. He's going to tell them all about Jesus. He's going to tell them all about what the gospel means to him, his definition of the gospel. Right? But before he does that, he gives them these things that he wants them to kind of think about and remember. And the first thing he tells them is, is that we make each other better. Like, don't forget that. that when I say we, I mean we, we Christians, when we're together, we make each other better. Can I get an amen from the congregation? Amen. That, that when we... When we stick together, when we fellowship together, when we, we make each other better. He, he talks about being thankful for them, about thinking about them. He says, I'm always thinking about you. I'm remembering you. He says he's praying for them. And then he says this. I, I want you to hear this. It's really interesting. He says, 
I've been wanting to come see you for a long time now because I want to give you something. And then he stops. Now you have to remember how Paul wrote his, wrote his letters. Paul did not actually write with a pen on paper. He wasn't actually writing. He dictated his letters. Most people didn't write. Writing was a craft, a skill in that day and time. And he had someone, probably Sylvanus, who was actually the one who wrote things down and he would like dictate them. He was saying, so they're very oral in nature. You can hear the oral nature, and especially right here. He says, I want to come to you because I want to give you this gift. And then he stops and says, well, no, let, me, let me say that. That's not exactly what I mean. He says, that is, what I really mean is, I think we can be mutually encouraged by each other. He remembers, I not only want to give them a gift, but I, they're going to give me a gift too. I'm not only going to be a gift to them, but they're going to be a gift to me. Verse 11, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. And then he stops, verse 12, he says, that is, what I really want to say, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. He says, I know that we're going to make each other better. So here's what I want you to hear. Like as you leave this place, as you go to wherever you're going, you're going to make a lot. You're going to make a lot of new friends. You're going to meet all kinds of people. And that's great. That's awesome. Uh, in some ways, the friends that you've made in high school, some of them are going to kind of fade away, those friendships, in order to make room for new friendships. And there's nothing wrong with that either. You're going to probably meet some of the people that will be some of the most important people in your life forever. You're going to meet lifelong friends in college and in whatever you're doing next, and that's great. But what I want you to remember is stick close to the people who make you better. Be aware of what's happening to you when you're with that person. Are they making you a better person? And stick close to the ones who are making you a better person and work to help make them a better person. Paul says that, that in our Christian relationships, we always make each other better. And by the way, this is parenthetically, it's not in my notes. It just came to me like Holy Spirit. That is especially true of the significant other person that you might spend the rest of your life with in marriage. Is be aware do they make you a better person? Or are they leading you in a way that makes life worse? Paul says, I can't wait to see you because I know that when we meet, that we're going to make each other better. Huh? Now, the other thing he says here is that um, he says that we have an obligation. Uh, this is really interesting to me. Did you catch that? Look at verses 14 and 15. He says, I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. And the word that he uses there for obligated is the word that literally means debtor or debt. I have a debt. I, I owe something. I'm, I, I'm obligated to, to preach this gospel. What Paul is saying here, he says, I have this, he says, I have this long list of people who have always been there for me. Paul is saying, I have this long list of people who have invested in me my whole life, my whole ministry. And he says, and because I have this long list of people, I owe something to God and to them to, to preach the gospel to you. Now, it's very interesting. And Paul actually gives a partial list of those people he's talking about. At the very end of this letter in Romans chapter 16, he starts to name some of them. He gives a list. Now, usually when I get to the list, you know, in the Bible, it's a real snoozer, right? I mean, you know, so-and-so begets, so-and-so begets, so-and-so, and the list of the people, that's just kind of like something you just get, try to get through. But this is one of the greatest lists in the Bible. Don't miss this list at the end of Romans chapter 16. Paul starts to name the people on his list, the people who have invested in him, the people who have always been there for him, the people who have given him something, the people who have made his life better. Look what he says over there in Romans chapter 16. It's not going to be on the screen. You can look at it. But he says, he begins in chapter 1, I mean, chapter 16, verse 1, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at Centria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. She's been a benefactor 
Uh, many believe that Paul actually gave the letter to Phoebe and she's the one who delivered it to Rome. And he's saying when she gets there, treat her well. Treat her well. She's a deacon in the church in century, a century it was in Macedonia. And he says, and she has been a benefactor. That, the word ha- is a financial word. It means she has, like, she has pulled out of her pocket money to help so many people, Paul says, including me. She has helped fund my ministry. I couldn't have done it without her. All you have to do is look around you and you'll see the people who have funded you and invested in you. You say, I I couldn't have done it without them. He says, it's Phoebe. He says in verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus, a husband and wife, Priscilla, Aquila. My co-workers in Christ Jesus, they risk their lives for me. Here's, Here's two, a husband and wife, who Paul says, they actually risk their lives for me. Paul was always getting into trouble. He says, they, they risked their lives for me. Greet my dear friend Eponidas, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Oh, he says, what a great guy. What an awesome thing. He was the first person I led to Jesus in this area of the world. He says, greet Andronicus and Junia, probably also husband and wife. Andronicus is a man's name and Junia is a woman's name. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles and they were in Christ before I was. He says, here's this, like a a mom and dad to me in the faith. They've been Christians longer than I have. And and, and they're both apostles. He's an apostle, she's an apostle. They're both apostles and they have been in prison with me. Paul was always getting thrown into prison for preaching the gospel. He wasn't in prison because he didn't pay his speeding tickets or something like that. It was, he was preaching the gospel, and they would throw him in jail. And he says, and Andronicus and Junia, this man and this woman, they were right there in the cell with me, suffering with me. Think about that, the power of that. He says, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Can you imagine that? The Apostle Paul, his mother was probably dead. And she said, here's Rufus, my friend, and his mom has been like a mom to me. In other words, she bosses me around and she cooks for me and she tells me what to do. She's like a mom to me. That's Paul's list. These are the people, Paul says, without them, I wouldn't be where I am. And you have a list too. I want you to think about your list. I want you to write down before you leave to wherever you're going. Write down your list. These are the people who have invested in me. These are the people who have done things for me. These are the people who have, in some ways, have lived to, for me to do better. And the interesting thing about Paul's list to me is that what it does to him is it motivates him. He says, because of these people, because of everything I have been given, because of the way I've been blessed through these people who have just poured into me and poured into me, these people who have never stopped loving me, no matter how badly I messed up, they never stopped loving me. Who am I talking about? You know who I'm talking about. They've never stopped loving me. No matter what I do, they just keep loving me, right? Paul says, these people, I would never be where I am. And because of that, I owe something. There's this one scene with Jesus where he's telling this parable. And at the end of the parable, Jesus says this. He says, to him or her whom, whom, to whom much has been given, much is expected. And in some translations, that word expected is translated demanded. To whom much has been given i.e. you, to whom much has been given, much is demanded. And if you don't want to go with Jesus, I'll quote Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility. With great power comes great responsibility. You have been given great power. And you are going to a place where you're going to, your power is going to do nothing but increase. You will become increasingly powerful. You will. In your own world, you'll become increasingly and increasingly and increasingly powerful. You are special. And with great power 
comes great responsibility. Paul says, I owe a debt. I didn't get here on my own. As I look back at the span of my life, whatever good things I have accomplished in my life, I know that I could never have done it without the people in my life who invested in me all the way. I could never have gotten where I got without a whole host of people who have invested in my life. And because of that, I owe something. Now, you may not like that, that you're already in debt, even before you get to college. You may not like that you're already in debt, but what I'm telling you is, you like it or not, you are. We all are. We all owe a debt. My mother and father, my father had a ninth grade education, worked hard his entire life, and dreamed not about him going to college. He knew that was out of the question for him with a ninth grade education. English is his second language, but he made sure, he made sure that his life, his ceiling was my floor where I could start building. He made sure of that, you understand? That the people who have come before you have made sure that their ceiling, whatever it is, is your floor. And so you have a debt, Paul says. That should motivate you. It should motivate you. And the last thing he says is, we are not ashamed of the gospel. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why does he say that? Why does he have to say that? I think it's because in Paul's world, especially to where he was going, the city of Rome, there was this great temptation to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was this great temptation in the face of Rome, you have to understand what Rome was. You have to remember what Rome was. Rome, was, The city of Rome was the center of the universe in that world. It was the, the, the capital of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was the most powerful empire on the face of the earth. Rome as a city was, was, was New York City, uh, Tokyo, London, Paris, and L.A. all rolled up into one great, massive, powerful, intimidating City. If anyone tells you in the face of the American culture, in the face of the American power, in face of the academia, if anyone tells you that they are never intimidated by that, they probably lie about other things too. Of course you're intimidated. Of course there's a temptation to be intimidated. And there's always the temptation to be ashamed of the gospel. I have felt it. We have all felt it. You also have to remember that the Christians in Paul's day were a very small minority. They were a very small minority group in this massive culture whose values did not match their values. In fact, whose values, these cultural values, caused the culture to ridicule, belittle, and eventually even torture the, the Christians. There are two extra biblical writings. There are more, but two main ones uh, 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 that concerning the Christians of that day and time. We have two uh, references to Christianity in the earliest stages outside of the Bible that are super important. One comes from the Roman historian Tacitus. He was a Roman historian living in the first half of the first century, uh, uh, second half of the first century, first half of the second century. And he's writing uh, about this time period where Nero was persecuting the Christians. And uh, so he's one, Tacitus, he mentions Christians. And the other is a man called Pliny the Younger, who was also a Roman a philosopher, lawyer, and writer. And he also mentions the Christians. And both of them talking about the Christians of, of, of Paul's time, right? They're talking about these Christians during Paul's day. Both of them say basically the same things about the Christians. And what they say about the Christians, these are Roman writers, not Christians, writing about the Christians. And what they say is, the Christians are really, really weird, they're just strange. They talk all the time about loving each other. They, they'll like sell their, their property to give to each other. They, they, they talk about eating flesh and drinking blood. And they're just weird. They're weird. And they say this, they say, and people laugh at them. And, 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 and eventually people will persecute them. They, they torture them. 
and they tortured them because they're just weird. People will do that. They'll be ugly to you when they think you're weird because you believe in these crazy things like giving and loving each other. They're just weird. And Paul is saying, I understand. I understand the temptation to be ashamed. I understand that when someone is saying to you, as they did during the Neronian persecution, you either curse Jesus Christ and recant your faith or die. And some gave in and recanted their faith and cursed Jesus so that they could live. Of course they did. And some died rather than do that. But that was the choice they were being given. And Paul says in a culture like that where this massive, intimidating, all-powerful culture whose values are are completely different from yours, who they're trying to crush your values in favor of theirs. He says in in the face of that, Paul says, I understand the temptation to be intimidated and to be ashamed. But Paul says, but I want you to know one thing. He's, he's writing, remember, he's not there yet. He's writing to them. He says, I want you to know one thing, that when I get there, when I get there, I'm not going to be ashamed to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't care what the culture says to me, what the culture does to me, how the culture comes against me. I'm not going to be ashamed to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, because, and he gives one reason, only one reason, And it's not because the things that we fight about in our world, it's not all the things that we're debating on on social media. It's not all the hot potato issues. It's not all the current crazy issues that are going on. It's none of those things. None of those things. Paul doesn't mention any of those things. They were debating the same kinds of things in Paul's time, all the vow. It's none of that. None of that. He says that's, that's all just a bunch of hot air. He, he says, here is the one reason I will not be ashamed to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. The one and only reason. It is because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the absolute power to save lives, to save people from eternal death. That's the one and only reason I will never be ashamed of the gospel because it is the one and only power to change people's lives. It's the one and only power. Forget all the other junk that people are arguing about. It's the one and only power. It's Jesus to save your friends from eternal death. And Paul says, aside from all the other junk people are arguing about, that's the, that's the only reason I need to never be ashamed that I'm a follower of Jesus. Because Jesus loved people and he died to save people and nothing else matters. Do you hear me? That's what matters. Because that what, that's what gives you life through everything. That's the garden that all these people and many more who couldn't be here today have been giving to and investing in and trying to nurture in your life this beautiful garden. It's this garden that will feed you and give you life the rest of your life. When my grandfather, my paternal grandfather came to the United States in 1919, I think he was about 24 years old because there had been a war in Mexico, a revolutionary war, and that war had caused all kinds of horrible um, devastation and poverty in Mexico. And so he came to try and escape that and to try and uh, feed his family, right? So he came here, and in Mexico, he was a farmer to, to some, I mean, everybody in Mexico at that time was a farmer, some kind of farmer, right? That's the way you survived. So when he came to the United States, he eventually worked hard and he, built, he bought, bought some land. And the first thing he did, even before he built a house, was he built a garden. He started growing things. You know, like lettuce and strawberries and tomatoes and, of course, cilantro, because life is not good without cilantro. And, um, 
all the different spices. So he always had this garden. Uh, and I, as a little kid, my grandfather lived with us in the little house there on that land that he had bought, the house my dad had built. And the back was this garden. And I could go pick strawberries anytime I wanted to if they were in season. He had a blackberry bush. He had a pear tree. He had an apple tree. He had a banana tree. Uh, I mean, I, I never heard of Kroger or H-E-B till I was like 20 years old because H-E-B was in my backyard. It was this garden he had built. And it fed us. During the 1930s and 40s, you probably studied this in your ancient history class. <laughs> Some of you lived through that, didn't you? <laughs> this thing happened called the Great Depression, right? That impacted so many. But my dad will tell me that they never, ever wanted for food. Why? Because my grandfather had his garden. You see, what we have, what we have tried to build for you in this place, and your parents especially have tried to build for you, is this beautiful garden. It's called Jesus and the gospel. It saves lives. It's powerful. And it will feed you the rest of your life. It will feed you the rest of your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us so much. We thank you for giving us your son, Jesus, who is the power of salvation, as Paul says, for everyone, Jew and Gentile and everyone in between. That we're so thankful that your gospel, your salvation does not discriminate against anyone for any reason. And we're so thankful for that because it means that we can have it and we do have it. Lord, we pray now that you would just touch our hearts and our lives. And I pray especially right now for these seniors who are now going all over the place to experience life and to, to embark on this next phase of their journey. I pray that you would bless them and cover them. I can't wait to see the amazing things you are going to do in their lives. I can't wait to hear about it. I can't wait to see the Facebook posts and the Instagram posts. Father, I, I might even get on Snapchat to try and, and to make sure I can keep up. But I just, Father, I'm just so thankful for them. And I just pray that you would bless them now and cover them with your grace and your mercy. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you been blessed today? It's been a good day. It's not over yet. I know you're still going to have brunch and you're still going to have pictures, and you're still going to have all kinds of celebration. I'm so thankful for that. Uh, we love you, your church. We do love you. We're so thankful for you, and so thankful for ev all of you. I pray that God has blessed you this morning. We're going to close here and just with, a, with a, a song. We're going to sing together one more time. I don't want you, this is not a time for you to be picking up your purse and getting, you know, getting things ready to leave. We're still worshiping, so we're going to worship with a song. But before I do that, I want to, I want to, bless you because I may not get to do this for some of you. You're going to, you know, I know you're really going to miss me. I know you are. <laughs> and, and, uh, I, I love blessing you. So let me bless you. And then we're going to sing. And I want to bless you with the ancient Hebrew blessing from the old Testament where the prophets would raise their hands over the congregation and they would say, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his countenance toward you and give you peace. God bless you and go in peace. Let's stand and sing.
I should start off by just saying how good looking all these uh, students look up here. So give them another round of applause, please. And now, good morning to you. It is great to see everyone here today, both in person and online, worshiping with us. We have an opportunity today to recognize, to celebrate, to encourage, and also to pray for our graduating high school seniors today. Best yet, we get to praise and worship our risen Savior. Here at First Baptist, we have a rich history of faith and commitment to our students. One such legacy example is the Dr. James H. and Irene Landis Scholarship, and to present this year's recipients is current Landis Scholarship Committee member, Laura Bond. Good morning. Like Randy said, I'm Laura Bond, and I'm representing the Landis Scholarship Committee this morning. Our chairperson, Michelle Baker, could not be here this morning, but I want to say Thank you to her for organizing our group and doing such a great job this year. Um, for a little background, the James H. and Irene Landis Scholarship Endowment was established in 1984 to honor Dr. and Mrs. Landis through the annual recognition of outstanding students at First Baptist Richardson. Dr. Landis served as pastor at First Baptist Richardson from 1968 to 1973. He went on to serve as the executive director of the Baptist General Convention of Texas, president of Hardin-Simmons University, and was named a distinguished professor of religion at Baylor University. Over the last 37 years, this scholarship fund has grown thanks to generous contributions from the congregation of First Baptist Richardson. The earnings from this endowment provide yearly scholarships to our students who demonstrate academic excellence, commitment to religious school and community activities, as well as financial need. Please consider contributing to this fund to continue the legacy of Dr. James H. and Irene Landis. All right, at this time, we're gonna recognize our recipients. So students, when I call your name, if you'll step forward and wave, and we will hold our applause until the end. Jonathan Cluis. Sarah Cobb, Malat Erget, Esther Flowers, Christelle Mencinsa, Gina Schmidt, Ben Sider, Reagan Sharon, and Michaela Welch. Please join me in congratulating this year's recipients. As I stated earlier, our church truly values our student ministry, uh, values our students, and values God's word. And so one of the traditions that we have at the church is uh, we get to celebrate not only their graduation, but we get to give them a gift of a Bible from the church with many of your verses that you have given to us, your favorite passages that have been highlighted in the Bibles that they'll be able to carry, carry on with them for the rest of their lives. So thank you for being a church that values students and that values God's word and wants to pass that along to our students. At this time, I'm very honored to be able to introduce to you the senior class of 2021. After each student is introduced, they'll be able to receive their Bible from Pastor Ellis. And also, as I introduce each student, please hold your applause until the end so that all names can be heard. First up is Jet Arrington. I told Jed earlier, Jet and Ben Baker Livingston had to set the tone for everybody walking down. So this is another part of setting the tone. So if this goes well, you know who to thank right here. <laughs> so Jed Arrington attended uh, J.J. Pierce High School. Plans after graduation are to attend Texas Tech in the fall. <laughs> ben Baker Livingston. Ben Baker Livingston, Ben will attended Plano East Senior High, will be attending University of New Mexico in the fall, majoring in business and playing baseball as well. Liberty Beavers Curtis. Liberty was also an attendant of Plano East Senior High. She'll be attending University of Oklahoma, majoring in genetic counseling, with plans to travel the world after that. <laughs> Alex Benavides. 
Alex is graduating from E.J. Conrad High School and will be joining the Navy shortly after graduation. Alex Cart is graduating from Prosper High School and he will be attending Mississippi State University in the fall. Jonathan Cluis. Jonathan attended Richardson High School, will be attending Texas A&M University in Galveston, and will be studying marine engineering. Sarah Cobb. Sarah Cobb graduated from Allen High School. She will be attending Austin Community College and then transferring to UT Austin following that. Marcellus Dennis. Marcellus is graduating from Richardson High School, will be attending University of Mount Union in Ohio and be playing football there as well. Avery Doyle, graduating from Prestonwood Christian Academy, and she will be attending Montclair State University to pursue a BFA in musical theater. Malat Irget will be a graduate of Berkner High School. She'll be attending college, and right now it's undecided exactly where. Jared Farrell. Jared will be graduating from Richardson High School, and he will be attending a Dallas College of Richland campus. Esther Flowers. Esther Flowers will be a graduate of Garland High School. She'll be attending Hardin-Simmons University in the fall with a degree majoring in strategic communication. Zane Givens. Zane Givens will be graduating from Richardson High School. Undecided exactly where that might lead him, but adventures lie in the future of Zane for sure. Danielle Looney. Danielle will be graduating from Texas Connection Academy and will be taking a gap year this next year. Christelle Manzenza will be graduating from Richardson High School and will be attending UT Austin in the fall. Amanda Saving is graduating from J.J. Pierce High School and will be attending Rice University in the fall. Gina Schmidt graduated from Allen High School and in the fall will be attending Baylor University. Ben Sider will be a graduate of Richardson High School, will be attending Texas A&M University and be studying business. Reagan Sheeran Reagan will be graduating from Plano West Senior High and attending Baylor University with a major in religion. <laughs> Kaylin Surratt graduated from Allen High School, will be attending University of Texas at Dallas, majoring in chemistry. Katie Springs attended Berkner High School and will be attending Oklahoma State University, majoring in molecular biology and biochemistry. It sounds like we had a lot of people that did the same thing in school. <laughs> Michaela Welch. Michaela will be graduating from Plano East Senior High and attending Oklahoma Baptist University, majoring in political science, and will be part of their cheer team as well. Okay, thank you very much. Today's an important day as we transition our students from our student ministry. Now, we do want to keep them through the rest of the summer. So we're fortunate to be able to do that. But it's also a time of commissioning our students beyond student ministry. And to lead us in this time of prayer and commissioning is Pastor Ellis. Oh, it's a special morning. It's a special morning. Uh, some of these kids have grown up in this church since they were little babies. And, so, um, and actually, y'all were little babies when I got here. And you're not anymore. So it's a special moment. Uh, and I wanted to, for all of us to participate in this moment. Uh, you, many of you have invested in their lives throughout the years. You have not only given to this church in ways that have allowed them to go to camps and mission trips and, and scholarships, but you've also taught them, and uh, some of you have taught them in the nursery, and you've taught them all the way through. And so this is an investment of our lives in, in, in God and in his kingdom work and in their futures. And so, uh, guys, I want, seniors, I want you to experience those who love you and have invested in you, I want you to experience them praying for you. And the way I want to do this is I want us, and I want you to participate, I want us to do a concert of prayer for our, our students today as we commission them into uh, whatever God has for them and their journey from this point forward. Uh, they will be scattered all over, as you've already heard, all over the state and all over the nation, and God is going to use them in mighty ways. 
So um, I'm going to ask the students to stand. Stand one more time. Students, just the students. And I want you to turn around, stand and turn around so that you're facing uh, the people who love you, the people who have invested in you, the people who value you in ways that maybe no one else does because these are people who have invested you in, in really personal ways. And what I want us to do as a congregation, we're going to have a moment of prayer. And what I want you to do, I'm asking you to do, is actually to pray for these students, and I want you to pray for them out loud. I want all of us, I want to hear a, a cacophony of prayer throughout this entire, and, and I know for Baptists this is not easy, okay, but I want to hear a cacophony of prayer, a concert of prayer washing over these students. I want them to hear you and to feel you as you pray for them. And so, uh, students, if, if, if you will, uh, we're going to, Students, you can bow your head and close your eyes. And the rest of us, I want you now to begin praying out loud for these students. Go ahead and pray now. Father, we thank you for these students. We thank you for these, these young adults that you have, you have invested in their lives, their whole lives. We lift them up to you. We place them in your hands. We pray that you would be honored and glorified through their lives. We pray that you would go before them wherever they go, wherever their journey takes them. Father, we know that you will never leave them and you will never forsake them. So we place them in your hands now and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining our online worship experience. Be sure to check us out on social media. And if you have kids, check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. There's great stuff on there to engage your kids. Here at First Baptist Richardson, we're committed to serving our community and bringing them the things that they need. To find out more how to serve and how to be a part of our missions opportunities, visit our Facebook page. Guys, we also want you to stay connected to a group. So if you'll go to our website, fbrichardson.org slash online groups, you can find a group, email the leader, they'll invite you to join them. We're all connecting by way of Zoom and other uh, means. We want you to know you are not alone and to be able to fellowship and visit and pray together with others who are in the same situation you're in. Also, while we're in these times, we are still ministering and so your gifts are desperately needed by those we're serving. So if you go to fbrichardson.org slash give, you'll have an opportunity to participate in the offerings that we are sharing with this community as we continue the Lord's ministry. Thanks for watching us today and we can't wait to see you again.